Seth, what an absolute pleasure. It's a delight. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. I haven't been to Wales before, and it's a pleasure. Really. <laughs> It's a delight to welcome you here. So when I was preparing for this, I figured that a great place to start would be with passion. And the reason for passion was that when I go through Seth.blog, I did a little search and I found that passion, if you search for it, it comes up 32 times. If you type in professionalism, then that comes up 41 times. So it seems to me like these are two concepts which I just had to speak to you about today. So from my understanding of it, it seems to me as if you have this belief that passion is a choice and that the sort of myth that you were trying to debunk is that we're not just going to stumble into our passion. Um, and I, I love that you talk about that we have this choice of um, work before passion. I believe that that was an article which you wrote. And you start off that essay and you say, offer me something I'm passionate about and I'll show up with all of my energy, effort and care. That's a great way to hide. So I wonder what is the change or perhaps the conversation that you were trying to start about the concept of passion? Well, it's one of the cores of the new book and the practice requires us to not need passion to begin or to persist. Passion is a luxury and passion is something that like, what a weird coincidence that there are passionate people in the world doing all these jobs that just happen to be jobs to doing all these jobs that just happen to be things that people need and are willing to pay for right? That there's no one who says I'm passionate about being a light, a lamp lighter or a blacksmith anymore. Oh, there are no jobs for those people either. What a coincidence. I think that if we say I can't do the work because I don't feel like it, I can't do the work because I'm not properly motivated, that I'm not passionate about this. What we're really saying is I'm afraid. And the useful skill is deciding and practicing being passionate about whatever you've decided to do, not doing what you think you're passionate about. Mm. I wonder, could you share something from your own life, perhaps a story, a venture, perhaps a project mm -hmm. that started off as a professional endeavor? So showing up and showing up and showing up, and then you ended up finding your passion for it later on. <laughs> Oh, that's everything I do. That's speaking on stage. That's writing books. That's uh, engaging with people who are doing work that I care about. That's supporting nonprofits. When we start anything, how can we know we're actually passionate about it? We're incompetent at it. People who are passionate about riding a bicycle didn't know how to ride a bicycle when they started riding a bicycle. People who are passionate about juggling or magic tricks, right? They got that way after they got good at it. And I am in the same boat, right? That my whole perspective is my underlying passion is seeing what's possible and helping other people get there. But within that, the range of ways we can do that is enormous. And I'm really trying to strip away so much artifice that we have put in our work so that we can get back to the practice and so we can do the work in a way we're proud of. I love this concept of the practice and I want to delve into that in so much detail with you. I think that really, um, as I mentioned it, but there we have um, passion for 32 searches on Seth.blog. We have professionalism of 41. And I feel as if in your model, these two are so closely interlinked. So um, I think that, you know, in your sort of model of, of, you know, like a hierarchy of needs, a hierarchy of, you know, passion, if you want, and passion would be at the top. Professionalism would be at the bottom. So when I was preparing for this conversation, I found a great article that I know another advocate of professionalism, Stephen Pressfield. I know that he wrote about you. And this was an article from 2013. And the article says, or the article is called, Why I Love Seth Godin. And quote, <laughs> and quote unquote, he says, what I love about Seth Godin is that every time he pitches a new idea to a big company, they throw him out on his butt. 
that's the craziest thing we've ever heard. It'll never work, you nuts. Get the hell out of here. So it seems to me as if being a professional and showing up, you know, even when you don't feel like it, which I feel really is at the heart of professionalism, a sort of self-management. So I wonder in your career and with this practice, what role has being the professional played for you to get to where you are? It is entirely possible in 2020 to make a living putting on uh, vulnerability theater and doing whatever pops into your head, making uh, a, a YouTube video that sort of gets a lot of views and then going and doing a different thing. But it's not reliable and it doesn't, it's not resilient in the face of change. When I started in the book business, I got rejected over and over and over and over again, 800 times. And it wasn't until I was able to demonstrate to the people who bought books that I was serious, that I was in it, that I saw them and what they wanted, not just me and what I wanted, that I was able to start selling books as a book packager. And the same thing is true for the internet company I started or for giving talks. I gave 300 speeches, more, maybe 100 speeches before I got paid for one. And you got to show up all in if you want to get invited back. And it's that simple. And yes, that means you're going to have to fake it. You have to fake being passionate because the same way you fall asleep by faking the fact that you're asleep until you're asleep, you can fake the fact that you're passionate until you're passionate. In terms of the book, the practice, where does professionalism map onto that? Well, the practice is a profession that we are showing up not as a hobby, not just for ourselves, but for other people as well. And if you're going to make a promise to other people, well, then you better keep the promise. And that's well, all it means to be a professional is make big promises and keep them. I love that. I love that. How do you conceptualize the professional versus the amateur? So the amateur is doing a hobby and there's nothing wrong with being an amateur. I think amateurism is way underrated and it's a way for us to become who we want to be. And don't ruin it by trying to sell what you make. Don't ruin it by trying to be half a professional at the same time you have the spirit of an amateur. And one of the, I mean, the origin of the Olympics is that they made up the rule for amateurism to keep out working class people who couldn't afford to do it for free so that they had a chance to win, right? And uh, that gave amateurism a bad name. I think that what it means to be an amateur is you are truly in it for the right reasons, but it's also possible to be a professional and be in that for the right reasons, but the reasons are different. And is this a decision? Is it a daily practice that separates them? It is a commitment on the regular that the amateur can get frustrated and give up. The professional is not allowed to give up. I love that. I love that. So when I think about like this term professionalism, I, I think that in the book you talk about how professionals produce with intent. So could we talk about that, how they sort of intentionally produce over and over again, sort of regardless of their feelings? Well, so what is intent in this case? If you are trying to will the outside world to love your work, they're not going to hear you doing that. And if you are attached to that outcome, you're going to burn out because burnout happens when we are stressed at our commitment, stressed because we want to do it and we don't want to do it at the same time. So we burn out. If you can let go of that, let go of your attachment to the outcome and simply and merely do the work regularly, the best you can learning from what doesn't work and then doing it more, you can do it forever because there's nobody who's holding anything back from you that you need. You have committed to seeing other people, giving them something that you hope that they will engage with. But if they don't, then you'll still do the work because you're a professional. 
I love that concept. And I recently just had a chat with Maria Konnikova and sure. she, she was a, um, she just wrote a book called the biggest bluff, um, detailing yeah. her journey into professional poker. And she told me on the show, she goes, uh, that life is more like poker than chess in the sense that in chess, there's always conceptually a right move, but in poker, um, you could have the perfect hand and still lose, or you could have a terrible hand and still win. So she's told me that when Eric Seidel, this legendary poker player, was mentoring her, that he would always say to her, he's like, I don't really care whether you win the hand or lose it. All I care about is that you made the right, you followed the right process. So where yeah. does that map into your sort of thinking? So as long as we're talking about poker, we need to talk about Annie Duke. Uh, former world poker champion and brilliant author. And she makes the incredibly important distinction between decisions and outcomes. That think for a minute, Joe, about uh, a good decision you made in the last three months. You got it in mind? Did that decision have a good outcome? Everyone always picks one that had a good outcome. It did, yeah. Because that's how we decide it's a good outcome, a good decision is it had a good outcome. This is nonsense. And this is what they teach you in poker. If you made a good decision and it still didn't work out, it's still a good decision. On the other hand, if you made a bad decision and got lucky, you've just gotten lucky. You haven't learned anything about decision making. And yet, particularly in sports and business, we criticize people based on the outcome as opposed to criticizing them based on what's in their control, which is the decision. And so the practice is about focusing on the decisions because the outcomes are out of your control. Mm. On that point, are there any examples you could share with us of perhaps something where you followed the process correctly, perhaps in your professional career, and you still had a bad outcome? Oh, so many times. You know, um, I lost $40 billion US because I ignored the World Wide Web for the first year that it was available to me and I stuck with email instead. So I didn't start Yahoo. I wrote a book about, ya about the internet. That was stupid. It was a great decision. It's a great decision because based on who I was and what I knew and what my resources were, in that moment, it was the right choice for me to make. It turned out I got unlucky and the other alternative would have had a bigger upside but it was a good decision that I pioneered the development of CD-ROMs with New York City book publishers. And then within two years, CD-ROMs disappeared as a medium. I made the right decision based on where I was and what was available to me. And the outcome was not what I needed it to have happen. And there are other times where I've been lucky, but I didn't necessarily make the right decision. I just was in the right place at the right time and got lucky. And so what we learn from this is that the practice is about what's in our control, not what the outcomes are. Okay. Um, on that point, if we're sort of detaching ourselves from the outcome and merely focusing on the process, I would love to, to um, sort of, pick you up on that because I suppose that even that in a sense is quite liberating in the sense that I, I feel as if, you know, I could, it's, it's like almost stoic in a sense that I could play like we talked about the perfect hand and still lose. But I suppose that all comes down to then making sure that we are following that right process day to day. And I guess that a, a large part of that, like we linked to well, on the professional aspect was sort of detaching emotion to it if that sort of makes sense about not getting drawn into um, emotions and focusing on that sort of type two thinking, which I know Daniel Kahneman makes. Um, I wonder what sort so of- So it is, it is very much stoic. And most people don't understand what that word means because it has come to mean something else in our language now. But yes, this happened. What are you going to do about it? Is different than this happened. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Things that happen, happen, but they're out of our control except for our response or reaction to them. 
I love that. I love that. And, and could I just uh, pick up on the 40 billion US dollar story? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm sure Marcus, that even that would have kept Marcus Aurelius up at night. I mean, how, how, how did you respond to that? <laughs> well, two years later, three, no, it was more than that. Four and a half years later, I sold my company to Yahoo. And so it wasn't a horrible outcome. But I realized that the world had different data than I thought it did, that I was not seeing everything. And getting out of my own head is hard because you have to be in your own head to be confident in your decisions. But on the other hand, you have to acknowledge that you don't know what you need to know. And so in that moment that I, when the web started to, to be really, to, to burgeon and grow, I took a deep breath and I said, the lesson I learned from this is I need to be much better at data acquisition and much better at questioning my sunk costs. That when similar things have come along, I have made ever better decisions because I've had ever better data. Why is seeing the world as it is, sort of not as you wish it was, such a key part of of that why is that so important well you know toddlers insist on seeing the world the way they need it to be because they're three years old structural engineers don't get to say i worked really hard on the bridge it won't fall down because they understand gravity doesn't care about them and that is the world as it is that the reason that planes don't crash and bridges don't fall down is because the people who work on them understand the world as it is and in culture, we get the chance to see the world as it is. That maybe you want to self-publish your opera with, that's produced with 40 cellos. And maybe you want to make $10 million doing it. But if you understand the world as it is, you will be realistic enough to know that you will not be the first person who ever made a cello opera that made $10 million. And you're going to have to do one of two things. Either not depend on making $10 million or not make a cello opera. And that's an acknowledgement of the world as it is. Mm. And I guess that it's also sometimes uncomfortable to see the world as it is, to choose to value truth over our own objective reality. So I wonder where does that process begin in terms of seeing the world as it is and sort of choosing to value outcome over ego because that's that's a that can be a difficult thing i've battled with this myself oh it's incredibly difficult it all depends on how much you care and how much it matters to you to be effective instead of being right because if you're willing to be effective then you will be open to feedback that teaches you how the world is if you need to be right then you will insulate yourself from that and you're never going to be effective why should we avoid becoming a hack? Um, I think it's fine to be a hack. And let me, let me first explain, because Tom's not here. Excellence is different than perfection. And quality has a very specific meaning that sits next to excellence, but is different. So quality does not mean perfect. And quality does not mean luxurious or expensive. Quality means meeting specifications. That if they say they're gonna deliver the package by noon, they deliver the package by noon, that is quality. If a Toyota Corolla can drive 100,000 miles without braking, that is quality. So seeking quality in our work is a cost of doing business. We have to do that. There are no typos in the book. Excellence takes that several steps further and says, what is surprising? What is important? What is a challenge to the status quo? What is human? What is personal? These things are all excellent. And so companies that used to be excellent, like Federal Express, aren't excellent anymore because they're just measuring things that make the money instead of measuring things that make a difference. So that's excellence. Now, a hack is somebody who simply works to please the market. So if you give 
someone who's addicted to nicotine, a chance to buy a pack of cigarettes for money, they will pay for them. That's a hack. That if you run a cheap fish and chip stand and it's the cheapest in town and the customers are happy with it because they want cheap fish and chips, you're a hack. Because you're not bringing a point of view to the culture, you're not changing anything. But if you want to make a living, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a hack. Just don't pretend that you're also an artist. Don't pretend that you are following your life's dream because you're serving the market. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm in favor of it. On the other hand, if you insist that the whole world like your work the way you do it, you're not going to be successful because the audience has a choice. And so the people who are running around saying, I have a voice inside of me. I have to let my true self out and I demand people like it they're going to be unhappy. And so in the creator's workshop and in this book, I draw out the tension between the two, because if you're going to be successful as an artist, you're going to have to copy some of the mindset of the hack, which is I see the market. I acknowledge the market. And then you say, but I can change things just enough, just enough to make them mine. And that is where excellence kicks in where excellence kicks in when Tom talks about any of the firms that he's been talking about for 40 years, it kicks in because those are companies that could have been hacks, but by adding a point of view, made things better. I love that concept of the marriage between seeing the world as it is and also seeing where it could go. And I love how you say that that tension between them is where excellence starts. I love that. I love that. So I want to go back to the, the fountain of all goodness, Seth.blog. So another article of yours, which I saved, um, was entitled Plenty More. And I think that this maps so nicely on to this discussion of excellence. And you say the biggest cause of excellence is the story we tell ourselves about our work. It's a choice, a commitment, and a lifelong practice. So I suppose on this point, where does this journey towards creating art, becoming excellent, sort of swaying away or minimizing the hack and focusing more on the artist? Because I think the people listening to this show, that, that is what they would want to focus on. Where does, that, where does the work begin? The only place to start is where we are because that's where we are, right? So we start where we are, we commit to a lifelong practice, but then the key part is right now I have this moment. I have this customer. I have this project. I only get to have this moment one time. What do I do in this moment to be the professional I want to be, to create the art I would be proud of, to show up, for somebody in a way they need me here. Because tomorrow there'll be something else to do, but right now I am right here. And that is part of the practice. What does it mean to do work that matters for people that care? Well, I mean, my simple approach is would they miss you if you didn't show up? Would they miss you if you weren't here? So, you know, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, which is 400 miles from here. And the pizza place where my family went it mattered to my family. And if they weren't there, we would have missed them. That there wasn't an easy substitute for the way they treated us, for the way it felt to go to bocce pizza, for the insider knowledge of getting the half-baked half pie, for all of the things, right? We cared. Most people didn't care. People in Buffalo cared, but not everyone. And we would have missed them if they were gone. So I'll call that work that matters, even if you're just making a pizza. <laughs> I, I, I love that example. How, how do we internalize that? I mean, just for, for example, for, for, I suppose, for this podcast or in my own life, how do I create the journey of making people miss me if I was gone? You know how. You just are afraid. All of us know how. All of us have seen it. In our lives, there are people who we care about, who we would miss if they weren't giving us X, Y, or Z in commerce. And we know we could do something like that, but we hide because we don't want to be on the hook. 
And what my book is about is the joy of being on the hook, as opposed to racing around trying to get off the hook. To put yourself on the hook is to make promises ever better to a group of people, smallest viable audience, where you can keep those promises. And what the industrial economy teaches us is don't get noticed and don't make promises because otherwise you'll get in trouble. So there's the fork in the road and you got to pick one or the other. How does the professional, the artist, the creator deal with imposter syndrome? So imposter syndrome, as far as I know, exists in every English speaking country and maybe everywhere around the world. That feeling that as we succeed, we're a fraud. We have no right to be here. Our opinion doesn't matter. We're unprepared. And people say to me, well, how do I get rid of the imposter syndrome? How do I get rid of that feeling? And I say, well, of course you feel that way because you're an imposter. That what it means to lead, what it means to go first is you can't be sure. You can't know it's going to work. And in that moment, you're tempted to blink, to run away, to hide. But leadership is voluntary and you can choose to lead. And that means you're going to feel like an imposter when you do. What is your self-talk when you feel that, you know, the lizard brain, the resistance tell you, I would rather hide than show up? I mean, does Seth Godin just still get that or, or have you sort of conditioned this self out of you? Every day, every day. Um, if you don't feel that, you're not trying hard enough. And if you do feel it, it means that you're on the right path and you want to try to feel it again. I love that. I love that. Let's touch on creativity. So it's when I was looking through the practice, it seems to me like for the longest time, creativity has often been thought of as a mythical gift reserved for right brained people, <laughs> you know, people with, you know, right dominant brain. So this idea that it's not a learnable skill, that it's a fixed mindset as such. And to me, it seems like the conversation you were trying to start with this book is that actually it's a learnable skill, that the magic is that there's no magic. So you make the point that we've sort of misunderstood creativity. So what do you mean by that? I think it's almost impossible for anyone to articulate a sensible argument that creativity is a gift. I just don't see how they can say that because everyone has been creative at least once. At least once everyone has solved an interesting problem. At least once everyone has connected with someone else, told a joke that was original, said something that mattered, everybody. So if you can do it once, well now the only question is, can you do it more than once? That's clearly not a gift, doing it the second time. So it's a skill, like every other skill it improves with practice. And we built cultural dynamics to brainwash people into thinking it's not a skill and to punish people who try to learn the skill. My argument is the practice gets us the skill. That if you wanna become creative, get better at putting ideas into the world to test. Get better, you know, if you wanna write a great book, it helps to write a great page. If you wanna write a great page, it helps to write a great sentence. If you wanna write a great sentence, it helps to write some bad sentences write a lot of bad sentences and sooner or later a good sentence will slip in and then you're on your way to writing a great book. But these are all skills. No one is born with a novel in their head. Everyone is born naked and unable to speak. And sooner or later we figure out how to be in the culture. And then one day we stop trying and creative people keep trying. Mm. And I suppose when I look at your life, I mean, you publish a blog post every day. I mean, you've written more best set, you know, more best sales than probably a single town will, <laughs> will, will ever publish. Um, I wonder this concept of writer's block, because this will obviously be a sort of for the, the aspiring journalist, the aspiring writers, potentially the person that does want to write the novel or the book or the bestseller. How could someone approach that, that, that concept of writer's block and they say, I, I just, I've got no words in me. I, <laughs> the, the block has hit me. How do you approach something like that? Yeah. So people who are listening, can't see these, but these are my writer's blocks. I make them on my laser glow forge. And one of the sides says there's no such thing as writer's block because it's true. 
There is no such thing as writer's block. It's invented. What we really have is being blocked because we are afraid of bad writing. That if you can get over your fear of bad writing, you'll have no trouble doing bad writing. And if you do bad writing, some good writing will slip through. Believing in writer's block is the first step to having writer's block. Refusing to acknowledge it and doing bad writing until you have good writing is the solution. You know, my daily blog, which is 7,500 posts in now, doesn't come out every day because I have the perfect blog post. It comes out every day because it's tomorrow. And I know that tomorrow there's going to be a blog post there, so I might as well make it the best one I've got. I love that. I love that. So how much of this book comes down to overriding the resistance and showing up day in day out how how much of that comes down to it well those are two things they're not necessarily the same i am forever indebted to my friend steve pressfield for resistance knowing the name of it makes a big difference but i think that the practice has many other elements to it that you know like for example reassurance is futile seeking reassurance from other people is a trap there's lots of traps and you know what we learn is that the practice insulates us from our own weakness it insulates us from the voice in our head that would like us to stop and if we commit to a practice whatever kind of leadership we want to do then we are more likely to be able to ship creative work mm. so i feel like in this book you made the case or well, i took it the case away that you know it's time to be extraordinary in this is marketing. I took the case away of, okay, it's time to appeal to the smallest viable audience to do work that matters for the people that care. What would you love for people that read the practice to go away and take with them? Uh, I'd like them to find two other people, have them read the practice and then start a group to support each other for the 30 days it will take to adopt the practice. Knowing the the punchline is irrelevant. We already know enough about everything. What we need is the commitment and yeah, the practice. So what I want people to take away from this is we're probably too weak to do it on our own. Let's go find some help and let's do it as a group. Seth, I've been an admirer of yours for as long as I can remember going on six or seven years now. Um, my last question for you today before you tell these guys where they can connect with you and about the book going forward is what makes a life worth living? I'd like to say that all lives are worth living. And I think that's our own story, but I will say we are choosing to, to share the planet with each other. And if you're going to take up this space and you use produce this carbon and you're gonna be part of our circle, we'd very much like you to make things better. Because if all of us figure out how to make things better and not hustle, not take, but in, in fact, figure out how to produce work we're proud of, then the culture gets better. And my hope is that as we retrench from just a horrible year, uh, the world catches its breath and decides that that's the work that's worth doing. I love that. I love that. Seth, can you tell these guys where they can connect with you and all about the practice? Uh, all the workshops are at akimbo.com, A-K-I-M-B-O. That includes the Alt-MBA. And you can find out about the book at seths.blog slash the practice. Everything will be linked below. Seth, this was such a pleasure. Thank you so, so much for taking the time. Welcome to Wales. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Good to meet you. Be well.